Welcome back to the Mina Kimes Show featuring Lenny, Monday Night Football Recap Edition. Uh, things are a little different here today because instead of Dominique Foxworth, the face in the window next to me, you probably recognize him if you <laughs> consume this podcast or if you watch ESPN, Sunday Countdown, or have followed his 15-year NFL career. Did I do my math right? 15 years. Uh, he is also the host of a new podcast called Glue Guys with Shane Battier. Alex Smith, welcome to the show. Mina, what's up? Thanks for having me. Um, before we get started, a uh, little bit of housekeeping. So we're flipping the order today. Uh, ben is pinching, pinch hitting, pardon me, for me to recap the Monday Night Doubleheader in the second half of this podcast with Dominique. So we, I am doing winners and woofs at the beginning from the weekend with Alex. Uh, we are each going to pick one winner and one woof from the weekend. Um, before we get started, can you tell people about your new pod? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, it's interesting. Started with uh, with Shane Battier and Ravi Gupta. We're all like good buddies. Both those guys are went to college together at Duke, so mm. lots of Duke stories. Unfortunately, mm. I hate that. Um, yeah, but it's interesting. Kind of a crossover between you know sports and business. Um, you know, I live out here in in Silicon Valley, and I talk all the time to companies, and they all are kind of fascinated about like what makes winning teams and winning cultures, and like how can they. You know, what are the things that transcend business and sports? And, you know, obviously they're trying to build, you know, high performing teams as well. And so it's interesting. Um, you know, it's it's fun conversation. We tell a lot of stories, have a lot of fun. Uh, so it, it, go check it out. It, it's uh, it's a unique podcast. We're very conversational and and again, uh, laugh a lot. So I love that. Shane, one of the smartest guys, one of my favorite people to listen to, probably shouldn't tell people about the Duke story stuff because you don't want people to be turned away from the podcast. <sighs> Can we edit that out? Like post edit this as a Duke hater. You know? uh, yeah, no, I, I'm, or, I'm, I, I make fun of Duke a lot on the podcast. So there's a, right. I try to, I try to keep it even keel. So my winner for the week, I'm going to start with a trivia question for you. One of my favorite NFL stats of all time is that in 2017, my guest led the league in average depth of target. People don't want to remember that, but it's true, Alex. It's a very important stat to me. Uh, just a very important stat. Who do you think was second league wide? Second. 2017. Average 2017? depth. 2017. Yeah, pushing the ball downfield. Um, gosh, I don't know. Is it? Wait, was it, am I second? Was I second? You were first. I was first. Okay. You not uh, know, we should have that stat ready at all times, by the way. Uh, the game manager. You know, it, it's an important manager. stat. It's a narrative buster. I, you should have that one. Managing those games. Uh, number two, I, I have no idea. It's Jared uh, Goff. It's Jared oh, Goff. let's go. Who's my there winner for the week. Um, so I wanna, I, I, I'm excited to talk about him. I'm excited to talk about him with you because I thought he was magnificent this weekend. I thought it was his best game of the year. Lions fans were a little bit mad at me after the Seahawks game because I mostly just crapped on the Seahawks defense. I mean, he was amazing. He pitched a perfecto. It was what it was, but that defense was injured. They were bad. Guys were open. That was this game. He went up against a defense that has really stymied much of the NFL. And that's, of course, Brian Flores' Vikings unit. And watching them, Alex, we can get into everything that Goff did, everything that Ben Johnson did, but it felt like they had the answers for uh, the blitzes and the simulated pressures and early downs that we really haven't seen any offense do. A little bit of Green Bay, but they did it at a level that we have not seen this year. No, I mean, the, this Minnesota defense and this Brian Flores scheme has really dictated tempo to every offense it's faced this year thus, thus far. I mean, we've seen it. Obviously, CJ Stroud struggled against it. Uh, we saw what it did. Um, you know, again, this entire defense, I mean, this entire season, excuse me. Um, and especially with the pressure, right? This is the, the name of the game. It brings more pressure than anybody in the NFL. A lot of simulated pressures, line stunting. Um, you know, you're getting the all up uh, at the line. I mean, it, teams have, again, uh, they they come to the they come to the game again, dictating tempo as a defense, and that's really a rarity in the NFL. Um, and you saw again, this is a division matchup. These teams know each other really well. Obviously, played each other twice last year. And Minnesota had such a, I mean, sorry, the Detroit had such a good game plan yeah. um, for it. And you know, I think I think Jared Goff doesn't get enough credit uh, for his composure. Right. I think it's one of his biggest strengths to just kind of like who, how cool and calm he is. He's very much a California kid in that regard, like the cliche. And he talked about it after a game um, that he thought one of the keys of the game was was certainly their composure. And I think that was appropriate for him too. right in the face of a uh, big pressure on the road, crowd noise. Uh, again, I, I 
I say that because when you play these teams at home and you have the ability to use cadence, right? Especially these kind of yeah. Brian Flores type schemes, like it's a different animal when you go play them at their place, right? And, and you're you're back there with using silent cadence in the shotgun, lifting a leg. You don't, you know, they hold their water even longer. Um, and and to see the plays he made in that game, especially the big one, uh, you know, that he hit to Amon Ra Ooh. against the against the seven up look, like it was, you know, cover zero. Um you know, and I guess they, they had answers all day. So it was, it was really, really impressive. That play was so sick. Um, it was in the second quarter, I think, because the first quarter they struggled and they really fell behind. You, you can't fall behind a first down against this team. It's the first down we talked about in the preview pod. This Lions um, offense has been a buzz on first down for obvious reasons because play action pass on the table. They can run the ball. But the Vikings defense, they're so unusual in how they approach first down with their pressures. And if you get beat on that, then you're in a nightmare zone. But in the second quarter, they started to really perform well in early downs. And you talked about that touchdown to St. Brown. I mean, so like you said, they were they sent seven, kept in Montgomery to pass protect. And that what I loved about that, Tim Brown, he comes across in motion Alex, and you can see the safety. They had some kind of split safety look. The space he's coming up, and then he blocks uh, Van Ginkle. Tim Brown, or Patrick, pardon me. Great yep. blocker, by the way. Big dude. Uh, so you got everybody's covered up in protection. He has time. And then what you have to do, because, again, the defense is unique in that they play those split safety looks behind the blitzes, right, which you don't see a lot in the NFL. You just got to rip it. <laughs> and you got a quarterback who is sitting there. Like you said, he's so calm. He's well protected. The scheme is ready for the pressure, and then he just rips it to St. Brown. And it was just, when I saw that, I thought, oh, they might actually win this thing. You know, the thing I loved is I think when you, again, you go up against these hyper-aggressive defenses, you you actually have to, like, match their aggressiveness. Yeah. Right? Like, I think that's the only way to combat it. And so often, I think t- teams go the other way, right? And it's, it's this mm. negative because they... We can't have negative plays and they kind of guard. And then I, th- I think it actually just works against you. And so uh, it's a nature of sometimes they are going to make a play and they're going to get sacks, which they did. But at the same time, if we can hit them for a few times, a few times, obviously there's huge big play potential and you could see it in their game plan. You know, the lines do for everybody out there, like the lines do a lot of double calling, right? There's two or three calls on every single play. Um, they build in kills, cans, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, with Minnesota, oftentimes, I, I guess I should flip this. You you know, you have a normal drop back pass on and you'll can it versus a, a pressure look, right? Um, you get up to the line. And versus Minnesota, you could tell they built it the, the entire other way around, right? Like yeah. we're going to call the pressure beater every single time first. Uh, on that play you're talking about, get up to the line. You can see Jared got give the thumbs up. He goes to a little <laughs> dummy leg lift. He get, yeah. You know, he they got the look they wanted. Uh, motion him over, get into the seven-man pro, and then re- essentially just running sluggo seam, right? It's 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 a... It's a play that every team has yeah. kind of day one install. And, uh, you know, Jared looks the, looks the player off, obviously the double move to the left and then comes back and rips the seam. And it was just, uh, it, it, it was unbelievable play call. And then execution was, was perfect on top of it. And it was like very cool to see, but that game, man, I, I mean, Super Bowl rematch going on on, you know, the West coast, but that, that game was the game of the day, in my opinion, um, unbelievable totally. back and forth and, and delivered all the way till the end. Darnold played well too. Yeah. I mean, uh, but Goff for me is a big winner given the level of competition, you know, that that defense has looked like one of the best in the NFL. And I love what you said. We can wrap here before we get to your winner about matching aggression with aggression and how important that is. Because the thing about all of that crazy stuff they do, there's vulnerabilities, there's zones being vacated. There's, you know, like if you, if you're willing to rip that ball, you can, but uh, you saw Jordan Love do it a little bit against them. I don't know if you remember in that game. And you definitely saw Jared Goff doing it in this one. And just a really, really special performance from the entire unit, honestly. But I thought Ben Johnson, I mean, that was Ben Johnson against Brian Flores. Iron sharpens iron. It was a great matchup. And he certainly came out on top in that one. So, yeah, very excited for uh, Jared Goff and, and this Lions offensive performance. They are an absolute wagon. All right, your winner for the week. Crazy, real quick on that before. Did I hear correct? You know, earlier this year, I think Jaden Daniels broke the completion percentage for a four game stretch in NFL it, history. Seriously? And I think Jared Goff just broke it. Oh my God. I think, I think an 83% completion percentage over four games. I think he just set an NFL record and obviously capped it off against. And he's pushing the, the ball one. downfield. Yeah. That's what's so special. Yeah. I mean, to be, you got to be willing to like the digs. They were hitting the digs over the linebackers. It was just. That's so crazy. Um, what a great job he's doing. All right. You got, you got a different kind of winner. Okay. Yeah. Winner. Um, this is kind of a new exercise for me. So trying to go through and, uh, you know, analyze <laughs> obviously who had the biggest day, you know, 
for me, the one I just kept coming back to, especially, uh, you know, after last night's game was Mike Tomlin. Yeah. Um, you know, he took a big risk. Uh, he really broke a norm. I, it, it, it's funny, you know, in, in professional football, especially there's this, there's this deal that like, you can only have one quarterback, right? There's this whole stupid saying, if you got two, you got none. Um, which I don't know where that came from, by the way. Um, <laughs> but you know, this nature that you can't switch a quarterback, you couldn't take a look at Russell Wilson in, in the middle of a season and see what he's done. I certainly didn't think Justin Fields had warranted getting benched at all by his play. Um, in a lot of ways, I thought he had played really well. And, and, and I think every other NFL head coach would have just kept doing it. Um, and Mike Tomlin took an incredible risk, I think, and, and could have faced a ton of criticism. And in fact, you know, early on in that, that first quarter, it was looking like it, you know, if, uh, Russ dirted a couple balls and the booze started to come out. Yeah. Um, but you know, obviously ended up coming and, and playing really well. And, and especially I think throwing the ball downfield, uh, involving George Pickens was, I think was at the core of, of, of the move a little yeah. bit, I think was the ability to kind of. Um, stretch some defenses, not let them be aggressive towards you, you know, especially uh, utilize George Pickens' talents. Um, you know, and listen, and I think it's one of the best things Russ does is throw the ball downfield. It always has been. Um, he fits this scheme as well, right? I think both these quarterbacks fit this scheme. They want to be run first. They want to play action pass. They want to bootleg. And I don't want to overhype what Russ did. He played He played very solid, right? Like there, there, yeah. there weren't any throws in that game, though, that I like were jaw-dropping. Um, you know, jaw dropping good... catches. So. Yes, but he gave his guys chances. I don't want to take anything no, away no, from but... him either. Like he he played really smart. He saw the one on ones. He put the yeah. ball up when he needed to. Um, but yes. for me, Mike Tomlin again to come back to him. He he. This was risky, right? Yeah. This was a this was a risky mo move. And this is a guy that you know, like he uh, he's so unique, right? You hear him in press conferences. He comes up with these sayings and stuff that just, uh, I don't know where they come from, but uh, certainly he's a good football coach and I think deserves his flowers in this moment. And I'm not saying that Russ is going to be the quarterback for the rest of the year, but I, I think the ability again, to push back on the narrative that you couldn't do this yeah. right? in the middle of the season, given what had happened with Russ's injury, that you couldn't do this. Cause again, I think if, if you were coaching college or high school or any level of football, like this isn't a big deal. I want to take a look at the other quarterback. We got a good football team. He's a good player. Like, but for whatever reason, the NFL, um, it, it's like uh, faux pas, you know, like you can't, you can't touch this and, and uh, hats off to him, I think for sticking to his guns and um, you know, taking a look, I think they're in a great situation with both these guys and, you know, may end up needing both of them to kind of continue to play down the line. Yeah. It, it was a super high risk maneuver from a guy who's bought up, who has as much, um, I guess, institutional credibility as, you know, any coach in the NFL outside of like three or four right now who can do this kind of thing. Right. Uh, and it was a move. I questioned. I was like all week long. I was like, I don't get this. You and me both. I, <laughs> okay. I don't, I didn't see it at all. I watched a ton of snaps on Justin Fields and did not see it. I thought he was playing fine. And then for equally important and, and I, I, I felt bad, but like, I didn't see a lot from Russell Wilson last year. And I think what you, you articulated, they got exactly what they needed from him and what I am sure Tomlin made the bet hoping for, which is the willingness to push the ball downfield to George Pickens. Like he, I think he had five throws over five air yards in this game, uh, two underthrown to Pickens, right? One, the tight end caught with one hand. That was, I thought a pretty good throw. The touchdown was beautiful. Uh, and then Calvin Austin wide open. But here's the thing. I, I know I'm saying that, and it sounds like shade when I'm saying they were underthrown. But there are certain receivers in the NFL where an underthrown ball is a great decision. <laughs> and that's how I, I was like, great. Keep just, you know, what, what is like, sir, I forgot who, which, who was the first receiver to say a uh, 50, 50 ball to me is a 80, 20, but that is, it is true with George Pickens, right? He is a guy you should, I mean, have you, I, not your career. Is there anyone like that who you, he reminds you of? Well, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more and I'll never forget, you know, like as a quarterback, your experience is like, uh, to, to always, you know, you want to lead your receiver and you always, if you're going to miss, you're going to miss it long, right? Like that was always growing up. If you were throwing a goal ball or a post ball, like that's just the way you were always kind of taught um, to miss on the safe side. And then I'll, I'll never forget uh, getting to the NFL and, and certainly playing with receivers and getting even taught by like offensive coordinators. Like I'll never forget Mike Martz. I had Mike Martz my fourth year. And I'll never forget him ripping me one time. Like, like stop overthrowing. <laughs> these one-on-one -on -one go balls, yeah. right? It's like, it's our advantage. 
Like if 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 you're gonna air air on under throwing it, like you get PIs, you get catches, like still good things can happen. Um, and I think especially with these receivers and listen, George Pickens is maybe one of the best deep ball threats. Certainly when you talk about elevating and, and high pointing a ball in the whole NFL and he fits again, this identity of this Arthur Smith offense, get these backs, run the ball, simplify offense, get the one-on-one and put it up. Um, and that's kind of what that game plan looked like. And, and I think also, I wonder, I mean, this is speculation, but certainly even the play calling looked a little different with Arthur Smith. Mm. I, I felt like the rhythm of it, the things they were getting to yeah. with Russ under center. More under center play action. Yeah. 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 It was different. It was different than with Justin. And so um, don't know if that was at any part in this decision as well, but uh, it is, it, I liked it. They played to Russ's strengths and, and it showed up and obviously, you know, 30 plus points and 400 yards and, and a big win. So, yeah, no, uh, listen, Mike Tomlin completely deserving of, of the win this week. Uh, Cause that could have gone real sideways. And a lot of us were wrong. Uh, in, in thinking that that was a move that wouldn't go well. So we'll see moving forward. A lot of ball game left to be played, but I'm done betting against the Steelers generally and, you know, whatever dark magic that team has, man, they just win games. Um, and the defense is still extremely good. Okay. Uh, so my woof uh, is CJ Stroud and it's more, more, more so the Houston Texans. It's not CJ Stroud. Before we get to this game against Green Bay, I feel he, here, here is my fear with CJ Stroud. He is beginning to be the new Justin Herbert for me, where every week on tape, I'm like, this dude is putting out some of the best throws I've seen of any quarterback, and yet everything around him is crumbling. He's constantly in third and long. They're constantly running the ball with no success on early downs, and guys aren't open. And it's just, I am starting to really worry because we're about halfway into the season. This should be a Super Bowl team. But Alex, it feels like the infrastructure around him is not good enough right now. Yeah, um, gosh, I'm so torn on this because, listen, I am an enormous CJ Stroud fan. Like I, you know, I've I have two sons that both want to play football, and my oldest wants to play quarterback. And I've I've thought about this. Like, if I were to pick one quarterback that you could like watch and be like, this is what you, yeah. this is what it looks like. Like, this is what playing quarterback looks like. Yeah. I think I would pick CJ Stroud, honestly. Like, you know, listen, Patrick and Lamar and Josh, like, they're, they're, that's different. It's a, it's a different deal. But when you talk about, like, just, like, classically, beautifully playing quarterback, like, yeah. it is so fundamental. It Look, he makes it look so easy. He is so dialed in. Um, he is so sound. Um, I mean, he's I, – He's a phenomenal athlete. I don't want to take that away from him. But like he again, he's just so fundamental. And it's so crazy to say about a second year player. Like yeah. it's absurd. I, I even think he, in some ways he's more fundamental than Joe Burrow. Um, and he's had, you know, two rough games, maybe two of his roughest games of his career this season. Um, both of them, I think, are two of the best teams in football, though they played against. He went on he went on the road to Minnesota and he went on the road to Green Bay and struggled. Um, you know, and watching that film though, I you know, I'm, I'm left with, to your point, like there, was, it, there wasn't anything he missed out there, right? Like there wasn't a lot of opportunities. This O-line struggled. They got pick stunted five different times up Oh front. my God. Good I Lord. Mean, Pick I, up a stunt. I, I mean, the, the, the uh, one I, I posted, the one where Sean Gary is just, uh, well, there's a million with Rashawn Gary, like just wide at like a lane, the size of the 405 going straight through the gut. Okay. Sorry. No. So I, infuriating. I think. I think, you know, they don't have Nico Collins, which was on on pace to, you know, maybe set the all-time or the single season receiving record. I love that they got Joe Mixon back. I think it really helps. To your point, this first and second down production is is much different with Joe Mixon. Um, they really missed him, uh, you know, whatever it was for that four or five game stretch. I, I think they're going to be fine. Um, the AFC is not what the NFC is this year, which is crazy because I think the narrative has been the otherwise, like the last five years. I mean, the narrative is that the AFC is stronger. The quarterbacks are better on the AFC side. Um, I think you could very much make the argument that, you know, the NFC North in itself uh, is, is certainly got the, the best football teams, maybe the three best football teams. Um, so I, I, I don't want to make too much out of it. I, I understand what you're saying and you saw, but like, I don't know. I'm still so bullish on him and, and, and the Texans in general, but do you feel like, because this Green Bay pass rush, 
had not been good all year. And I thought Half League called a great game. Like some, they were stealing stuff from the Vikings, some of the simulated stuff. You talked about the pick stunts, but this offensive line has been a problem all year long now for Houston. And I, I just feel worried because if you can't run the ball and your offensive, doesn't it feel like he's constantly in third and long? He is. And again, I, I, I do think, you know, week one, it looked unbelievable with Mixon. It's been a little better uh, with him coming back. I, I just wonder, there were like, did you get some unscouted looks? Did Green Bay throw some, you know, the picks done stuff at you? They got some pressure. Both those losses were on the road. Um, maybe a good, like, maybe, maybe it's not the worst thing to get humbled a little bit right now. Yeah. Um, again, you're still atop the division. Like, I, I still think you're in a good place uh, when, it talk, when you're talking about the AFC in, in general. Um, so, I, I think at, they have what it takes. Like, that's what I guess I come back to. Like, yeah. I, mean, I, I think D'Amico Ryan's is awesome. Like, again, yeah. I, defensively, I think they're they're so stout. The two edge players are phenomenal. Um, yeah. You know, hopefully get Nico Collins back. And like, again, pardon me to your point, like maybe you start building it a little more around CJ on uh, first and second down, right? Like, and I, I know you want to get under center and hand the ball off and, you know. The final drive that set up the field goal, two, the two negative runs from Mixon – before setting up the third and 15 broke me like Bobby yeah. Slowick. You can't like your quarterback is amazing. You, you haven't, they stacked the first one. They stacked the box. I'm like, come on. Like really you're not you're playing for the field goal here. Yeah. Right. Cause you got a wild and crazy man on the other side. Yep. You can't, I don't know. That really infuriated me, but I feel Bobby Slowick. I am not, I got my eye on you. That's all I'm saying. We'll see. I mean, I, I, Again, sometimes these young coaches, like they, they know their system, right? He knows the yeah. Shanahan playbook and, and, and that's what he's running. Um, and that's built, it's built to play with the lead, right? And that's always been the case. All those offenses, when it's working and, and you're rolling and you got all the bootleg misdirection stuff off of it, it's so hard to defend. But when it's not, right, that, that's when these offenses have struggled, right? That's when right. the Rams had to go out. That's why they made the move to go get, you know, Stafford. It was like, well, at yeah. some point we might have to play from behind. We might have to be able to just drop back and throw the rock. Yeah. yeah, but I think they have that in CJ. Like, so I don't. They know have why, that. Yeah, you know? I think it's this whole like, oh, we got to run early downs, and we got to set up the play action off of that. But then you don't have Nico, and the run game's not working on early downs, and it's you got to like to your point, you got to pivot. I do have one question before we move on to your wolf. You said that uh, CJ Stroud is a quarterback who you like would point to for your son. This is teach tape. <laughs> do you point Jordan Love and say don't do that? <laughs> and I mean that yeah. in a complimentary because I love. Mm -hmm watching Jordan Love and I love both of these quarterbacks and um last week I said they were like the Betty and Veronica of the NFL to me which uh, is a very dated reference but like on one hand CJ Stroud's like always making the right decision he's like almost like a robot going through his progressions and then Jordan Love's just out there hooping I I, I feel like he is just wild yeah I mean I think I I love Jordan Love as well he's so talented um you know and and it's so there's so I love watching Green Bay in general. I mean, they, they, it's yeah. like who are you going to defend? I mean, these five wideouts that all make plays, especially. Um, it, it's so cool to see even you know the drama that was with Romeo Dobbs the last oh, couple of weeks and to see what the game he has. Every yeah, slant like, went for a first down. It felt he, like he caught like seven slants. I'm like, can <laughs> we get can we get inside leverage? Um, but you know, it's it's kind of we've seen it in Green Bay for like 30 years. You know, dripping off your back foot and like hucking you know digs over the middle of the field and deep crosses. Uh, it's certainly not something that I'm accustomed uh, <laughs> to being able to do. And so, but I, again, to, to our point of like being aggressive, like I, I love the aggressiveness Same. Right? and, and even Jordan, like to come out and he throws the pick early and, and I've care. been, I've been that <laughs> when you throw care. a pick on your opening drive, I mean, uh, it's like, it sucks. It just like <laughs> all week you've been prepping and to come out and throw a pick like that. Oh. And it, he's just so unfazed. And I, and I'm I, unfazed. I, I'm, I, I love to see that in a young guy. Right. Like they just uh, didn't, yeah. didn't waver, just kept his foot on the gas. And we ended up throwing three picks and they still obviously does not care. Something. That's yeah. what I'm saying. You don't kick a field goal. With it. I saw someone put a meme of like Rogers as the angel on one shoulder and Brett Favre on the other shoulder and like Jordan Love <laughs> constantly <laughs> being pulled in both those directions. Um, two of my favorite young quarterbacks. Um, I really enjoyed this game, but I do feel like just to sum it up. Houston offense needs help, uh, whether it's in early down play calling, pass protection. Obviously, Collins coming back will help in a big way. Um, another team that needs help is is your Woof. They're yes, running out my, of dudes. My Woof, by the way, and again, this it was so funny. Like this exercise, I'm like, all right, I for whatever reason, I kicked into like what fan base woke up today and is like <laughs> feeling the worst. Ooh. And there was no shortage. I mean, I had lots of like honorable mentions here, right? Like, yeah. I mean, 
the entire city of Cleveland. I mean, Carolina is a dumpster fire. <sighs> I mean, New Orleans isn't looking good. Like there were a lot yeah. of bad spots. Yeah. Um, but for me, I mean, the Jets, I mean, it's, there's a lot of fan bases that are hurting. But yeah, I it was my hometown. I was at the game yesterday. I mean, it was, it's like weird. Mm. Both, my, both my former teams playing each other. Uh, very, very strange. You know, like I swung by the Chiefs hotel on Saturday night and got to see a bunch of old friends. And then and then the Niners are hosting me at the, at the game. It was, uh, you know, I felt very conflicted. Um, <laughs> so, but the Niners, the Niners are my wolf. Um, I mean, this, listen, this is, this is when this roster's healthy and rolling, it's, you know, maybe the best in, in all the NFL and man, they have dug themselves a hole. I mean, after some early rough losses to the Ram, I mean, the beat up Rams and, and the cards, <sighs> Um, but this one, you know, Super Bowl rematch, I thought they were going to get up for this game. I, I expected them to go toe to toe, you know, certainly even a little revenge maybe. And, uh, just really kind of laid an egg. I mean, the, mm. the, the energy all day, this offense couldn't get anything going. Uh, I felt bad for Brock Purdy out there. I mean, <laughs> who he, the group he had with out there on the field at the end of the game, you know, listen, obviously no Christian McCaffrey. A Uke gets hurt. I mean, Debo has an illness. He's not yeah. out there. There's no Jawan Jennings. Um, I mean, it was brutal. Like, obviously, on the defensive side, to, to lose, you know, Javon Hargrave. They still know Drake Greenlaw. Like, they have – this is a very top-heavy roster. Yeah. And when you start checking off some of these guys that now these are season-ending injuries, um, it, this is a – it's a tough hill to mount, right? And you mentioned yeah. your Seahawks got to win. They're winning the division. <laughs> I, I just, like, as a Niner fan – Waking up and like hearing the news on Brandon Ayuk now, like that it looks like is an ACL. Um, and these are a bunch of big season ending injuries to key, key players. And this roster, when you build it like this, health is such a big part of this, right? Like yeah. those guys, when you have this many big contracts at key positions, they have to stay healthy. And they were able to avoid a bunch of these injuries last year. And so far this year, they haven't. And for a team, again, I think that was expecting to. Go back to the Super Bowl, certainly make a big run, right? Right now, you're sitting outside the playoffs. And, uh, you know, I, where's the help coming from? Obviously, Purdy didn't help himself with the three-pick game, but the, you know, the the final one in the red zone, you know, stings. You know, kick the field goal and make it a one-score game yeah. and you still have a chance. Uh, it just all the way around, it was deflating. You know, the 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 half of me that was there, obviously, <laughs> supporting the Yeah, Niners. no, no, I hear uh, you. Yeah, I mean, it's that this whole season – with the Niners feel if I mean, cause last year, the beginning of the year, or probably at the beginning of this season, I thought that was like, this is a Super Bowl team. And I said, if I have one hesitation, it's that they were the fourth healthiest roster in football last year. Doesn't feel like that's going to happen again. It usually doesn't happen again. And boy, has it not happened again, you know, watching them really all season, but particularly in this game and, and comparing it to the Super Bowl, I, I, what I've been thinking is like, damn, maybe CMC should have been the MVP because <laughs> The offense is so different without him. It really is. And I know there's other fans who are like, oh, I'm sorry you lost one of the Avengers, right? But obviously they've lost more than that. But particularly against this Chiefs defense, Alex, like where they're going to play a ton of man coverage. He was so often the mismatch guy against yep. man coverage. And he was also the Chiefs. If the Chiefs have one vulnerability, I talked about this last week, I would attack the linebackers in coverage. They're so great against the run. But again, you lose CMC, you lose Debo, like – who are you going to against this type of defense? You just kind of don't have any answers outside of George Kittle. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, and the crazy thing about that statement, I totally agree with you, is like Jordan Mason has played well. Right? Yeah, like, he's, he's I, a good back. He like, he's he's like just a, a normal part. back. He's a no, normal that's, good back. Yeah. Well, that's the point, though, is it's like it's just not the same. And especially in these cr critical situations, like third and short, the red zone, uh, it's where the, this unit has struggled. And you mentioned yeah. it, like you watch the Chiefs play, and, and even when they're in zone, it's sticky, right? Like it's sticky everywhere. And nobody was uncovering. They're getting doubles. You know, at the end of the game, it's just Kittle. He's getting doubled. Um, and in, in that in that situation, right? Like especially out of the backfield, you can do so many clever things with stacks and releases and get a guy like Christian, you know, great leverage on a route. And you just can't go to any of that. And 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 again, I think Kyle Shanahan is is, you know, most likely maybe in the best offensive mind in football. And yesterday like obviously with missing some of his guys but like spags just uh he, they couldn't get anything going the entire yeah. day and uh again hats off to the chief's defense and spags you know i i think he is the best defensive coordinator in football he doesn't get a, doesn't get enough credit 
Uh, Trent McDuffie is a stud. Yeah. Um, so it, it was, you know, again, one sided. I thought it was going to be, you know, I even picked the Niners. I thought they, you know, again, had bad taste in their mouth from the from the Super Bowl and we're going to get their revenge. And it just it, 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 it wasn't even very close, to be honest, like from, a, from like in the stadium, from an energy level, it just it never it it never got very close. And again, just uh, deflating is what it felt like. Certainly there, for, for all the kind of fans. Let me wrap here. Is there anything you think that they can do to turn this around before we? Because because like is there, I mean I, you know Purdy I think he's been actually quite good this year. Worst yeah. game of the season. He'll play better. Although that's a very difficult defense. Some I mean, some truly diabolical stuff that he was doing too on tape. Uh, is there anything you think though that they can? I mean I, some guys will come back. Jennings will be back. Yeah, I mean I hopefully. You know, they can't lose anybody else, obviously. That kind of, I think when you start talking about get Jennings back, get Debo back, obviously it was nice to see Ricky Pearsall come out and make some catches. It was very cool. I mean, the, you know, to kind of get a standing ovation from the entire stadium after everything he's been through. You know, maybe he emerges, you know, as a little bit of a playmaker. And and, and hopefully Christian, you know, his rehab kind of continues to progress. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, those, are, those are still some pretty good weapons when you, when you say it. And hopefully they kind of find their rhythm and climb back. But uh, you're certainly... I mean, at this point, you're, you're 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 looking up at a bunch of teams in front of you in the NFC side, and so um, they haven't helped themselves here early. But uh, I, I certainly hope so. And again, they, I think a team that has the leadership to to do it. But we'll see. Yeah, when when uh, Patrick Mahomes is uh, stiff arming your safety in the end zone, it's just not your day. That was brutal. Oh. Um, God, that guy. He, I, if I was playing defensive again, I would hate him so much. Honestly, the, the scrambles are just the most infuriating things I've ever seen in my life. Well, scramble. it was funny even in that game, like for all the injuries the Chiefs have, especially once Juju went out, right? Yeah. And it's like, I mean, you have a rookie in Xavier Worthy. Other than that, there's not a, there's not, yeah, there's no guys outside lining I up. I know, right? Chiefs fans and, are listening to us talk about the Niners. They're like, oh, I'm sorry that you only I know, have. I know, but like it's uh, the respect was still crazy because it was still just getting so much shell coverage. Yeah, and it was just because of Patrick. Right, like it's like here you are. You're not like you're not like you're just like kind of lining up some guys outside and still just getting shell coverage almost shell the entire coverage. game. And they're just grinding out yep. four yard runs, yep. Dream, five huh? yard runs, four yard yep. runs. Yep. So yep. exciting. Um, all right, Alex, this is so fantastic, guys. Check out his podcast, Glue Guys, wherever you get your pods. I presume you can find it there. Also, obviously, you can watch him on Sunday Countdown. Thank you so much for joining us, making us smarter today. Really appreciate you coming on the show. Mina, thanks for having me. Why should you bet with Caesars Sportsbook? Two words, Caesars Rewards. Every bet brings you closer to the types of benefits only Caesars can offer. Hotel stays, VIP experiences, sports and concert tickets, and more. It's not just an app, it's an empire. Welcome back. Different voice, different faces. Thank you to Mina and Alex for bringing us in the first half of the show. I am Ben Solak. Regular listeners uh, might remember my voice from every other Thursday show. And uh, joining me is Dominique Foxworth, who regular listeners will recognize from the every Tuesday show. What's up, Dom? What's happening, Ben? It's nice to do this. And Mina getting in the way with all her opinions no. and thoughts. But the the fans have been asking for the Mina Kimes show featuring Lenny, hosted by Ben Solak, <laughs> guested by Dominic Foxer. They, that's what that's what the people want. Is that for yeah. those people in combination right there? Uh, we are providing the Monday Night Football recap. Was this the last doubleheader, or is there at least one more doubleheader? I think was, is there one more because Week Eight, like no one's on by because the NFL's trying to dunk on the NBA, right? <laughs> That sounds about right. The yeah. NFL's trying to duck on everyone all the time, and they are successful every time they try to do it. No. Okay, just just the one Monday Night Football game next week. So this was this the last doubleheader? All right, well, the doubleheaders can be fun. I think when, when there's one very bad game and one very good game. In this case, there was one very good game, and then, and then one actually kind of good game. We'll get to Chargers-Cardinals uh, at the end, but I think Ravens-Bucks, obviously the headliner, and uh, top of the show, Lamar Jackson. Don't know if you heard of him. Reigning MVP. Look, look, looking for the three feet. Well, good, good, good at football, Lamar Jackson. Uh, final stat line: seventeen for twenty-two, two hundred eighty-one yards. Uh, that's twelve point eight yards per attempt. We like that. It's a good day in the office. Uh, he now has three career games with fifty rushing yards and five passing touchdowns. Dominique, the rest of the league has four combined in NFL history. Do you know who, who, who the games are? Um, they're all. You said three: Lamar Jackson. Yeah. One is Mitchell Trubisky. I, I like um, you know the Mitch one. No. I, that's, yeah, I, yeah. I wanted to get you with Mitch, but you know the Mitch one. Yeah, Cam Newton. Yeah, yeah. 
Cam's got one, and then Lamar, uh, Mahomes and Allen have both done it in the playoffs. Uh, but I was hoping, I was hoping to get you with Trubisky because that. Mm, nah, I'm, gets, a, I'm a big Mitch yeah. fan. I, I think he just hasn't gotten a fair shot. That's what it comes Absolutely. down to, Mitch the, Trubisky. The you know, arc for Trubisky is coming. Uh, at this point, Lamar favorite for the MVP uh, at ESPN Ben. All the other sports books. You watching Lamar last night? Where are you at on 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 him, his MVP season, and what he did uh, against? <sighs> I mean, I think in this business, we fall into the traps of being hyperbolic often, which is fine because it gets people to listen or watch or whatever. But it becomes a problem when we're met with situations like this. It's like Lamar Jackson is better than Lamar Jackson has ever been. Mm -hmm. But that's difficult to say because last year when he was winning the MVP or when he was winning his first MVP, it was like, this is something we've never seen before. This is the best quarterback or the best we can see. We can imagine this man ever playing, but now he's better. And in the ways that he's better are not like eye popping ways, but he still has those incredible big passes down the field. But the things that I saw that I was most impressed with is number one, his accuracy is always the biggest concern. Going back to watching him in college, I was concerned about him being consistently accurate. The bowl game, his final bowl game stands out in my mind where it felt like all the arguments that it was like a running back playing football, those all felt dumb until I watched that game. I was like, oh, come on. Why'd you forget how to throw? But that hasn't been a problem at all um, this year. And also the blitz was always the way that you thought um, you could beat Lamar Jackson. But They've this Todd Munkin offense in the second year of it. Lamar seems more comfortable with how to address the blitz and he seems to anticipate and expect the blitz. He just seems like it feels like he's more comfortable. He's less um, hurried. He's less stressed. The decisions seem or he seems decisive and calm and confident no matter what's happening on the other side of the field. Yeah, the uh, uh, Todd Bowles blitz Lamar on 61.5% of his dropbacks in this game, right? It's the second highest next gen stats has for a Lamar game. And in the past, that's that's what you did to Lamar, right? Is just you you sent fire, you sent fire, you sent fire, and you tried to simplify those offense. You remember that Brian Flores game that Lamar played yeah. against Miami, where he just was forcing Greg Roman to all these bubble screens. He knew what was coming. There was such a nice rep. Uh, Ravens were, were were still down in this game. It was early second quarter. This was the big Rashad Bateman throw that wasn't a touchdown, yep. where they motion Hill out of the backfield into empty, and the Bucks immediately check it. Get both backers up in the B gaps, right? We have put six on the line. You are blocking with five. We are going to get a free rusher. So the Bucks are saying structurally, this is what we want to do. We want to blitz these empty formations. They get a free edge rusher, free guy off the edge, full slide protection. Lamar just whoop beats him in space. Not a problem. Never, never a problem for mm-hmm. Lamar. And then it's eyes downfield. He's directing traffic and hits Rashad Bateman forty yards down the field on the run. You're like, all right, you can't, you can't do this to the guy anymore. He's seen it on the season. A second in success rate against the blitz. Lamar Jackson is behind only. Patrick Mahomes it's it's what used to be the the kryptonite for this guy no longer is yeah that's a great situation to be in is when they have exactly what they want and you get a 40 yard bomb out of it (laughs) that's a good place to be in as as a team as an organization as a quarterback uh it just is it feels and it I I hate to do this to you but uh there's like a different feel about it and about Lamar in the pocket and Lamar, uh, his confidence when being attacked, that feels just calm and confident in a way that Lamar was at times, but not to this level before. And then there's these, uh, these throws that don't show up. I mean, the, the stats throw up, show up in a stat sheet, but you don't see that he's dropping teardrops in on the sideline. It's like different types of throws. He's rifling them. He seems yeah. to have every single, um, every stick in the bag that he needs right now. Yeah. You brought up uh, that the second year in Todd Mockins defense uh, offense, excuse me, and the level of comfort. And I feel like that's the thing watching for the first seven weeks. I, I, I feel most viscerally watching the Ravens, right? Mm-hmm. I, I'm experiencing it where I remember last year saying, listen, like the Monken offense, very different than the Greg Roman offense. They don't have the pieces to just move from the Greg right. Roman offense to the, the, the Monken offense. Like this isn't going to be a clean transition. And then, that Lions game last year, like around this time, week six, week seven, it felt like, oh, you know, they, they figured it out, but it never like really clicks like that a hundred percent. You know, it's right. not like a, it's not a binary thing. Light switch on, light switch off. Like even still as they were winning the AFC, you know, regular season title last year, they're still kind of growing into this, this Monken offense, which is complex. It requires adjustments on the fly, which, you know, Monken last year was all 11 personnel, all three receiver sets. This year has been a lot more 12. Like they had to kind of have a meeting in the middle. And so now as I watch, watch the Ravens through seven weeks, Lamar has uh, uh, 4.5 yards of separation for his targets. It's leading the league, right? They, they, they're they setting like new records in terms of like wide open receivers down the field. It really feels like now in year two, 
everything is coalesced. Bateman's playing better. Zay in year two, as they like this role, like at Monken with understanding. It it feels like this is the realization of a lot of the growing pains of year one. Yeah, and the the weak spot on this offense would be the offensive line, but they've been protected, I think, to some degree with the ability of uh, Derrick Henry, one, to run the ball, because that changes how aggressive defensive line is going to be, and the um, understanding of pass rush and uh, decision-making that Todd Munkin and Lamar Jackson have right now. So uh, I know at the beginning of the season, that was the issue offensively, was like, uh, mm-hmm. can this O-line hold up? And they seem to not be in situations where they're becoming in a problem for this team anymore yeah the, i have a question for you about that because i was i was popping through numbers on this ravens offense and right now lamar's getting a, a quick pressure pressure in under 2.5 seconds at like the third lowest rate in the league it's like mahomes tua and then and then lamar right and i'm trying to understand how much of that is is okay the schemed up stuff they throw so many screens right it's all these like swings and all, all the stuff that's like you know kind of in structure rpo stuff and I'm trying to figure out how much that is Derrick Henry and, and those 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 condensed formations and the fear of the running game. You have to play that run and, and worry about Henry. And then how much that is Lamar. And just when you are like yeah. unblocked as an edge rusher, you can't go forward against the Ravens. You got to freeze. You got to wait for seconds. Yeah. When you when you see that, knowing that this offensive line really like isn't that talented, that they should have this level of number, kind of where do you parcel out the credit? Yeah, I mean, I think it just is more about being able to threaten uh, like all portions of the field and mm-hmm. threaten – even every job, every responsibility that the linemen have and the blitzers have. And I think you made the point about the free rushers sometimes wanting to be under control uh, when going after Lamar Jackson, as if that matters, as if he can't shake you anyway. But I do think there's always, when there's an athletic quarterback, the the um, lane responsibilities are going to be a little bit more, you'll be a little bit more strict on it, which makes it less aggressive on the rushing. And you can only anticipate so many different types of coverages in the back end, which I think helps Lamar too. You're not going to see, we all know you're not going to play two man with Lamar without a spy. Like it's just something that he will never ever see. And I think that also allows him to be more decisive. And the point that you made, I think was a big one is like the screens and the bubbles, all those quick passes, those will cause D lineman to hesitate also. And you only get, you're only going to get, I don't know, 20, straight up pass rush sets, uh, snaps in a game. And if you take out the play action, I don't know, maybe you get 10. Like it's hard to get to get it done in that situation, especially when the Ravens are playing with a lead, which they so often are. Yeah, and you get those uh, those Sam Hubbard reps, right? And it's okay, yeah. we got our pass rush. We got our win one-on-one. And all of a sudden, Lamar's just embarrassing professional football players oh, in space. Gosh. You you say, right, uh, Ravens playing with a lead as they so often are. This is what I thought was cool from uh, the ESPN stats and info group. Uh, the Ravens second win this season, uh, trailing by at least 10 plus points, but it was this win against the, the Buccaneers. They also did so against the Bengals, one of three teams to do it. And that stat's important because the, the Ravens trailed the Chiefs by 10 in that AFC championship game last year. And that was that game where got away from the run well, real fast there in that second <laughs> quarter. And Lamar started throwing really aggressively down the field and kind of trying to get all back in one play. Travis Kelsey said after that game, we knew if we put up touchdowns, it was going to force their offense to feel a little antsy and a little pressed to get the ball down the field. It was kind of the Chiefs wanted to see what the Ravens looked like in a deficit. Before that AFC Championship game, Lamar hadn't been trailing by 10 plus points since 2021. It had been over two calendar years since Lamar had been down by multiple scores. I, I really think like when I, as we start to spin the Ravens forward and say, okay, this is clearly a playoff team. They're going to try to push for a Super Bowl again. When, as we go to spin them forward, I find myself feeling a lot better about this team having to play with the deficit. Obviously, against the Bucks, their ten point deficit was like halfway through the first quarter. There was plenty of time yeah, left. I didn't count. But I, yeah, I do feel I do feel better. I think overall about this team playing in a deficit than I have in seasons past. I think I think it's a big deal for their their postseason success, which this team desperately needs. The Chiefs quite possibly have the best defense in football. In Week One, the Ravens before they've settled into this. Um, mm-hmm. way of playing that I think is slightly better. They led themselves back against that defense in the fourth quarter into a position to win that game. There's Isaiah no likely that... put white cleats on. White cleats, <laughs> baby. Come on. There's, there's no uh, team in this league that the Ravens can't beat, including the Kansas City Chiefs. So there's nothing left to see. The biggest concern, and it's a surprising one, considering Baltimore's history and reputation, but the biggest concern is their defense and giving up uh, big plays in particular. So uh, yeah. that's something that they haven't been able to quite eliminate yet, but they got the good fortune of not having to deal with Mike Evans for the entirety of that game. But that's the one thing that I think I've noticed about the Ravens defense is uh, 
number one receivers give them trouble and it uh, it takes them out of the things that they want to do and the things that they do best. And just generally this defense is worse than it was last year. And uh, it seems like they, they're going to lose Marlon Humphrey or at least Marlon Humphrey at full strength for some extended period right. of time, which uh, only makes it more difficult. Despite the fact that I think Nate Wiggins is going to be yeah. a really good player. Wiggins is, is coming along nicely. I was worried about him. Yeah. He's a little skinny, but he's, he's feisty. Yeah, I, lo- I love a slim corner. Now he, He's got my heart. I'm, right. I, I root for slim corners. There's a there's a, a Rubicon. There's a holy line of demarcation. It's between Nate Wiggins and Emmanuel Forbes. You got to be above the Emmanuel <laughs> Forbes line for me. But as long as you hate uh, Nate Wiggins, I think I'm all right. Emmanuel all right. Forbes had a great pick last week, though. Like It, it was clear film study. Like He yeah. saw the underneath guy go, and then the middle guy, or the number two runner vertical, he was like, this is a dig. He ran it before the receiver did. So, and Give that's exactly some, uh, what he did at Mississippi State to get drafted top 16, <laughs> man. It was all fixed. It was yeah, all smart plays. Yeah. Uh, yeah, to the Ravens' defense, no team giving up more explosive passes this season than Baltimore, 25th in success rate and 28th in EPA uh, against dropbacks. I think, like, if there's a team that I trust to summon up the solution, I want to say it's the Ravens, right? Because John Harbaugh is such a smart coach. But then you remember, like, that there's been so much brain drain on the defensive side of the ball. And so you don't get to have... Mike McDonald sitting down with Anthony Weaver and with Denard Wilson and with Zach Orr saying, okay, what can we throw at the wall here to make it stick? It's kind of just Zach. And obviously I, they have other guys in the staff yeah. and I don't know those names as well, yeah. but I'm sure they got smart cat, smart cats in general. You, I, I want to have faith because it's the Ravens. So that's just kind of good yeah. policy. Um, but the fact that they're like adding Yannick Ngakwe in the middle of the season kind of indicates to me that they are at throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks mode. And it, I, maybe something comes down the mountain. I don't know what it is though, to solve it for this defense. Yeah, I think you're right, and I'm not sure that there's going to be a solve for the defense. The fact that matters, they have a lot of really talented players, and that might be enough on the defense side of the ball. If their offense continues to be as efficient or the the most efficient offense in the league, they're going to need a turnover here or there, a big third down stop here or there, and between Wiggins and Hamilton and um, – uh, Roquan Smith, like you, you feel like someone, and I mean, even Van Noy is going to make some plays, Matt BK, mm-hmm. like they have players that you know will be able to step up in situations. So I think that's how, if I was a Ravens fan, I would sleep at night, understanding that this defense isn't what it once was and is not quite up to the Ravens standard on defense. It's just like, hey, we got some guys that know how to make plays in big moments and hopefully they come through. We have an offense that feels unstoppable right now. Yeah. I will say, I agree with you on the Raven stars. Roquan through seven weeks. I don't know if he's nursing something. Uh, yeah. or like, you know, obviously age cliff comes fast. Roquan doesn't look like the Roquan uh, that he was last season. They're playing Kyle Hamilton at linebacker a lot as they try to bring Trenton Simpson along. Simpson's another guy like Wiggins. I see the vision. We're going to, I think we're yeah. going to get there, but yeah. it's a lot shakier right now with Simpson. There's some peak plays. Then there's some real tough plays. It's just so inconsistent with him. You're right. It, and it, it's the... Uh, yeah, it's it, the good thing about it is the issues are exactly what you would expect for an inexperienced player. Mm-hmm. It's like it's coverage busts, it's um, misreading a pull and hitting the wrong hole, that sort of yeah. stuff where you're like, all right, get some experience. He'll get comfortable. The thing I like about him, though, is that he is a super athlete. Yeah. And one of the things that I didn't love about their matchup with the Chiefs last year was how often they put Kyle Hamilton on Travis Kelsey. Right. And I get why you want to do that, but Kyle Hamilton is capable of man coverage, but like that's not what's best about Kyle Hamilton. What's right. best about him is the versatility that he gives. And so to take it back to Trent Simpson is he's more than enough athlete to stick with mm-hmm. Travis Kelsey or any tight end for that matter. And then that gives you the, the opportunity to still have Hamilton do his Joker business that you move them all around and, and use them in a bunch of different ways. Yeah, exactly. That, whenever Hamilton's role gets siloed, you lose the value of having yeah. Kyle Hamilton. You right. need to be able to play a chess match with him. Trent Simpson can touch his kneecaps up bending over, dude. He's got 35 inch arms. <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, Ravens defense, I think, needs a solution. But this offense, I think, yeah, can beat anybody out of the park. They just got to gotta do it in January. Uh, I want to move to the Bucs side of things. Uh, we'll talk about the on-field product, I think, uh, a little bit. I, I think we should start with the Chris Godwin injury and kind of the fallout from this. Uh, for anybody who missed the game last night, the Bucs are down 10 points, minute left, third and 17 on their own 18. Like, this ball game is uh, – on the previous drive, the Ravens had their backups in. This ball game is O-V-E-R over. Uh, but Baker Mayfield is in, Chris Godwin's in, all the starters are in. And Chris Godwin gets tackled, dislocates his ankle, pretty bad injury. You could kind of tell right away it was bad. ESPN didn't want to show the uh, the replay on the broadcast. Uh, Todd Bowles gets asked about this 
a lot in the post game press or kind of why is Chris Godwin in? Uh, was there any thought to pulling him? And, you know, Bowles kind of says we're trying to win the ball game. We had already gotten one successful onside kick. We we're going to try to get another. I, there was some, I saw confusion about the rules because at one point it was suggested only two onside kicks per game. That was a rule that was suggested, but not passed. So the Bucks mm-hmm. could have continued trying to onside kick it. Um, so he said, Hey, like, you know, we could have got another onside kick. You know, we're trying to win the game. Godwin is a football player. Like, you know, we, we compete out here. And he also made the point. We lost Mike Evans in the, in the first quarter. We only had four wide receivers dressed. Like we got to, we didn't have that many guys to just kind of chuck out there and, and, and replace Godwin. So I think, this is one of those things that like everybody who hasn't played is always like, why are these guys in? Like get all of these guys out. And there tends to be, I think a little bit more of like a both sides of them from dudes who are in the league. So I was curious for you when you see Godwin's injury and Bull's comments on it, are you like, listen, get him out of the game or do you kind of see the other side? I mean, I see the other side. I, I mean, I, I barely see the get him out of the game side of this conversation, mm-hmm. honestly. Like, um, the rosters are not enormous. It's not college for one. And two, they still feel like they're in the game. I don't, that's not a switch. And maybe you have, you hire some analytics guy or, or you give this on the analytics guy's responsibility to tell the coach when it's time to completely give up. But that's just not how you approach games. And if you're getting blown out, and you feel like it's completely over, then coaches eventually, like, the winning team will normally pull their guys, and then everyone responds in kind. But still, the rosters aren't really that deep. It's just this unfortunate thing that happened. It's It feels rare to me. It's not – yeah, it's uh, it sucks that he has to answer those questions. I get the probability of winning at that point is super low, but that's just never something that mm-hmm. has ever been, like – customary for a team that's two scores you can still get an onside kick it just seems weird to me to suggest that Todd Bowles wasn't protecting his players yeah it's it's it I think the reason why it cuts more is because Evans was already out and so in your head as like a Bucks fan or as a football watcher you're like okay Chris Godwin, who's already like arguably the, one of the most important people, he was leading the league in receptions, he was leading the yeah. league in first downs. Like, this was your guy, your stick mover. Like, you have to protect this individual. So, I think at, th- that's kind of the the retconning that people are doing. Like, kind of high size yeah. 20 like, oh, Evans down, how could Godwin be out there? But the, the roster point is a critical one. Like, they only, I think they only had the four active receivers. I think it was Trey Palmer, Sterling Shepard, Jalen McMillan, and Godwin that were available. And yeah, if they're trying to win the game, then guess what? You're going to need to have four receivers on the field for some snaps uh, or at least rotate the four guys through the three when, when you're trying to push the ball down the field. So I get it, but it is r- a really tough outlook now for the Bucks moving forward. I mean, if you want to be critical of them playing anybody, it was Mike Evans to me, honestly. Yeah, right. After Mike Evans scored that touchdown, he's limping to the sideline and you throw a go route to him <laughs> the next time, the next drive, you're on like, that to me is worth being critical. Like, all right, Mike, we get it. Even if we're going to leave you out there, what we're not going to do is try to get you to run past people when you're clearly nursing yeah. some sort of soft tissue leg injury. Like, that is fair to call um, Todd Bowles on. The other stuff is not. Yeah, hamstring injuries are taking our great receivers, man. Nico, Mike Evans, and Juju Smith-Schuster, just three of the best receivers we've got this year going down with the hamstring. Uh, (laughs) Another one from ESPN Stats and Info. Baker Mayfield has thrown 800 passes since joining the Bucs. 38 total have come without Mike Evans and Chris Godwin on the field. I mean, like this is, you know, they know where their bread is buttered. When you look at this Bucs offense, which really has been the driving force of success for a Bucs team that I think has been like largely impressive and has had some like sustainable real success, when all right, the next month, let's say, is no no Evans and no Godwin. Because Godwin's clearly out for the season and Evans got the yeah. hamstring. I mean, is there is there a hope? Is there a Sterling Shepherd renaissance we're looking for? Is there a investment in the running game? How would you hope they approach this upcoming month? Um I I I want to challenge you to put a positive spin on this. <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> I'm yeah, a big Cam McMillan sorry, but... guy. I love McMillan coming out. So to me, I'm like, listen, the rookie, let's go. Fifteen targets. But besides that, you're not yeah. going. Yeah, this this feels like a tough spot to be in. Um, I spent part of last week hyping up Baker Mayfield. But every time I did that, I also prefaced it by saying that this wide receiver tandem is uh, incredibly impressive. And they were running the ball well, too. So I guess that doesn't go away. But you can't win in this league. At, like, it's not 1993, like, guys. Like, we're not going to – you can't win in this league without attacking down the field. And, you know, as soon as um, Evans went out, that's when Baker started going downhill immediately. I think he threw an interception the next play, right? And then from then on, it, then the next drive, he tried to – or was it – yeah, the next drive, he tried to squeeze in in a tight window. It's like, huh, it just got worse as soon as Evans left the game. So, I think Baker is – a competent starting quarterback, but he's not going to lift 
uh, these non-Pro Bowl guys and to make this offense anywhere close to what it has yeah. been up until now. And that's the thing about Baker, which like I, I've been I've been very impressed by the Baker Renaissance in in Tampa Bay. I think some of what he does is is kind of crazy, unsustainable stuff, but a lot of it is is healthy, sustainable things. But what you can't say about Baker is Baker's not the sort of guy who like minimizes a loss on the offense, right? Baker's the sort of guy who keeps yeah. things under control and kind of you know the, the uh, I think Troy Aikman had had a, a comment last night where Baker got out of the pocket, he started laughing. He said, "When Baker gets out of the pocket, man, you just got to buckle up. Like you do not know." <laughs> <laughs> what's gonna happen and so right without godwin and evans you'd love your quarterback to safely matriculate the ball down the field with some six yard passes and ball control and no mistakes and no sacks and let's just be like you know let's win a, a defensive low scoring game and just like i is not in baker's dna i would love if he was capable of it i do not think he is and so this he's not the sort of quarterback who's equipped to have a bad receiver room because he's going to keep giving sterling shepherd chances down the field and trey palmer bombs and just that's going to make this offense i think very very volatile they're going to have some Big drives and some, some moments they look okay. Then they're going to have a lot of three-and-out drives, a lot of drives they lose yardage, bad field position. Not going to be complimentary football. And Tristan Wirfs, can he run some routes? Like, I feel like yeah. he's the best player they have on offense at First this holding penalty for Tristan Wirfs since 2022, oh, and it crazy. was awful. And it, was, it, it was wasn't terrible. a good one, yeah. yeah. And, and he, he was talking to the rest about it like three drives later. He was letting them hear it. Uh, last thing on the Bucks that I will say, Todd Bowles, you know, uh, criticism, God went in, God went out, whatever. This defense, man. Uh, 27th in success rate against dropbacks, 26th in EPA against dropbacks. I know they've dealt with a ton of injury over the course of the season, but they've given up 26 to Bo Nix, which is maybe the most defensive thing they've done all season. Uh, 500 yards to Kirk Cousins in that loss, now 41 to the Ravens. In this game, they were almost full health. Jamel Dean was out. Tyreek Funderburk, the rookie corner. Great name, Tyreek Funderburk. Uh, Funderburk was in, but besides that, they had 10 of 11 starters. They had the depth guys that they usually do. This is the moment where, you know, Bowles and the Bucks, like, all right, your star receivers go down. You're still very much in the race in a bad NFC South. Like you need to tighten the screws on this defense and, and, and win yourself a couple games, go 500 in the absence of Mike Evans. Like that's gotta be the expectation for Bowles as a defensive head coach through this season, man. Like they've had some splashy stretches, but largely not been impressed by a defense. That's a lot of homegrown talent, a lot of Bowles guys, you know, they, they've obviously lost yeah. some free agents, but still like this, this unit needs to be better, especially now with the offense losing some wind out of their sails. Yeah, this is a measuring stick game. Sorry to to cliche you up there, but it felt like this was for them because we had been kind of talking about the Bucks. I was like, ah, they're pretty good. They're I said on this podcast, I said out loud, I was like, I think the Bucks are good in the preview show. And then I and then Mina reminded me their upcoming schedule was the Ravens, Falcons, Chiefs, 49ers. Like, all right, maybe yeah. maybe we don't say that again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, this was the the first like matchup that I thought we could get a real look at how how good Baker has really gotten, and a real look at what this defense would do um, in the most difficult of situations. And the look that we got was not a pretty one. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that upcoming schedule for the Buccaneers. We'll we'll see if they can stay in the NFC South race, or if they're just right out of it. We'll find that out. Pretty, pretty fast. Now, you said it's not 1993 anymore. Nobody told the Chargers and the Cardinals. Uh, they, yeah, I'm sorry. They, they played point. themselves. 17-15 uh, to 15 game. The Cardinals won on the uh, final game-winning field goal. The Chargers only scored five field goals in this game. Uh, a lot of running, a lot of multiple tight end sets. Honestly, it was kind of a fun game. There were a couple peak plays from both quarterbacks. Yeah. No team uh, had a win percentage at any point in this game greater than 75% until the Cardinals Got into field goal range with 30 seconds left. So it was a close, uh, highly uh, competitive game. I want to start with the Chargers, who I think were like, a, you know, the media was either like, hey, Chargers are going to surprise a lot of people, or hey, the Chargers are going to suck preseason. And here they are, they're three and three. They got one of the best defenses in football by the numbers. They got a winning formula running the football. Herbert looks good. Like we were worried about that, how that foot injury would affect him, and he's largely been okay. Uh, our, I, it's a tough question to ask after a, a loss on the road to the Cardinals, but in general, like Chargers temperature check for me. Are you buying what this team is selling you through six weeks? Uh, yeah, I'm buying it. I think it's sustainable. The problem is it's not it's not a high enough level to be like a real contender. I think this is like a foundational year. Uh, I don't think that Harbaugh would say this publicly, but I think what they're doing so far is it's the first year of this program, so to speak, and this is impressive what they've been able to do i thought the defense was going to be uh, uh, very challenging and that and them turning out to be as good as they are right now is super impressive and encouraging they don't have any weapons on the other side of the ball and that's just an uphill battle for uh no matter how good your quarterback is and justin hasn't been perfect this year but it just feels like 
they need to develop a little bit more on that side of the ball as far as uh, people to attack downfield. Lad McConkey is their best receiver, which like he's good, but like no one is confusing him with um, a true A number one yeah. uh, receiver. No, it was a weird game. Uh, Lad had a couple of drops, and it was Josh Palmer making the hero catches and Simi Fajoko making the hero catches. Just right. 2024 Chargers is 2023 Chargers is 2022 Chargers, and you just kind of keep it going down the line. Yeah. Uh, I want to start, you brought up that defense, which I think has definitely been one of the biggest surprises of the league, uh, certainly for, for the Chargers. In this game, they come in against a, a Cardinals team that you know is going to want to run the football. The Chargers have been right. one of the best run defenses, but they've been doing it from very, very light boxes, right? 6.29 uh, average bodies in the box is the highest light box rate in all football coming in. They're allowing 38% success rate on the ground. Like this was the Jesse Minter college defense. We're going to spill everything to the outside. We're going to fit the run with our safeties. And the Cardinals walked out with three tight ends, just mashed them, just mashed them for, for, for four quarters, 50% success rate on the ground. Uh, this, this charge defense is, is so funny to me because Minter is doing exactly what Brandon Staley hoped to do as mm -hmm. going well. And so now everybody loves it. Ever hate it when Brandon was doing one going as yeah. well. Uh, when you see a game like this for, for the Chargers, as we continue to move to a do high world, as the Chargers are doing like three safety stuff and light box stuff, is, is this always the destiny for one of these these college defenses? One of these, they, they, okay, they have nice four or five weeks, and all of a sudden they run to a team that can get under center, have a big back in James Conner, and then they just get leaned on for four quarters. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the answer to that is no, because – in order to be successful, you're going to have to have some level of balance on the team. Like mm -hmm. that, I think this was James Conner, a James Conner special, it felt like. There was a lot of yeah. broken tackles and a lot of yards after contact. They threw Those the things, ball a ton, too, which yeah, they've not been that, doing this year, but they very clearly decided, hey, we want to get James against these these DBs because he's outweighs them. Right. Right, and that, that to me feels like, yeah, that's fine, but that's not going to beat a team that's able to put up points on the other side of the ball. I think it's a reasonable play, a reasonable way to play defense, understanding that in the modern NFL, with the rules and uh, the way that things are, it's going to be set up for the offense to have success. If you happen to have a, a week where you're not completely shut down on the run game, that stinks. But as long as you are, you don't combine that with giving up big plays, you'll be competitive in those games. Like this is not a time for us to throw out mentor or figure out a new way to play defense. This suggests to me that we had a bad week or at least honestly, Connor had a great game. Like he caused that fumble on the, on the not turnover. Like he smart. just, yeah, yeah. yeah he down. was just everywhere. Uh -huh. So that, that to me feels like this defense is sustainable. I wouldn't like, denigrated by saying it's, it's like a college defense i would say it's like a college defense with a higher pitch in my voice so that it yeah. sounds like i like that and we'll be up with the inflection so that way it's good it's like me talking yeah. to my daughter like, oh you excited very good uh james connor 19 carries 101 yards two catches for 51 yards he was the Jeez. leading receiver for the arizona cardinals he and trey mcbride both oh. 51 yards in part because Marvin Harrison Jr., three catches, 21 yards. This after the game, they played the Packers, were trailing the whole game, two targets, zero catches, zero yards. It was a lot. Uh, both Dan and Lewis were talking a lot about Marv, uh, how to get him reps, how to get him easier looks, how to get him activated. But then also watching the film and, and in this game, seeing some loafs and, and, and seeing some routes that he didn't necessarily finish and aggressiveness coming back to the football. I thought watching it back all 22 – Run blocking, man. Like, you know, you, you, no block, no rock. Like, we got to get a little bit more activated here. We're, we run outside the, to the boundary a lot in this Cardinals offense. You know, they go Connor upfield, but they also get him to the boundary. You got to get activated as a receiver there. Uh, we're now six, uh, seven weeks, excuse me, into the Marvin Harrison Jr. experience. We've had miles per hour discourse. We've had deep passing discourse. We've had funnel targets and jump balls. And I feel like everybody's everywhere on Marvin Harrison Jr. Are, are, are alarm bells ringing? Where do you stand on what you've seen from the rookie? So after week one, there were a lot of people sounding alarm bells. And then I went back and watched that all 22. And it suggested to me that they were just double covering him. And I was like, all right. And so I said, everyone relax. Marvin's going to be good. The next week, he had 100 yards and two that touchdowns in the first game. quarter. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so I puffed my chest out. And I was fine. And I stopped paying attention. And then every time I check back in on him, I see, like, like last night, there was a, a big drop. And they're like, and I, I, I didn't watch that all 22 yet. I was up this morning doing get up, but I'll check out all the things that you're saying, but I believe them to be true. And that's a whole nother different problem. I remember going back to, I dis, discounted anyone who said, because Kyler Murray said, like, it's not my job to get him the ball. And I was like, all right. And people were making a big deal out of that. And I was like, all right, whatever. It's, it's kind of 
is your Tyler's job, but I get what you're saying. to say things in a little yeah. bit of a cleaner way because he, he always <laughs> does this. He has like one liners. So you're like, Kyler, just don't say it like that and you'll be fine. <laughs> Kyler doesn't care what we think, obviously. But that um, those type of comments kind of hang around in my head where it's like, I, I don't know what's going on there, but this is not the production that you expect from this level receiver. I could also, I could always say like, maybe it's possible that we all, everybody got the, assessment of Marvin Harrison Jr. wrong, but like he had a clean like report. Like there were a number of scouting reports that had under weaknesses, none. Mm -hmm. Like legitimate, credible people said none, and I agreed with them. So I I it's gonna take a lot more than seven weeks of up and down play for me to come off of Marvin as Harrison Jr. Um and if we go through a whole season of it, then I will come to conclude to the conclusion that there is some sort of mismatch fit there because he can work in this league somewhere this is yeah. not this is some confusion that i don't quite understand yeah so there's a lot going on where i think there's a, a little bit of truth to every single theory on marv right now i think he's definitely frustrated and i'm not sure how much he's frustrated at like kyler or drew petzing the oc right. or even himself like he had like there were you know catchable but difficult contested balls and 50 50 balls in this game that he didn't grab and i think like at that, after having some quiet weeks, like pisses a guy off when you're a top five pick and you're not used to having the, the, those missed catches. And so I think Marv is definitely frustrated. I think that's affecting his routes and his his effort and his energy and his body language. And that just gets picked up on camera yeah. and it snowballs the problem. So I think for sure Marv is frustrated. I also think that he is running one of the highest rate of just vertical routes in the league right now. Like they just run, yeah. they, they are, run, they're not running him like prime AJ Green. They're running him like very old AJ Green. And the comp coming out was prime AJ Green because Marv can snap a dude off on a route, right? Yeah, every single yeah. six targets, every single one was a vertical stem route. It was curl, uh, vertical, like a nine ball or to the back shoulder to the comeback, right? When you're in a corner, like if you know this guy's not getting inside of the numbers, it just makes life a lot. You'd be so much more aggressive coming into the yeah. route breaks, right? And playing through, through through the body. And so the fact that they and, and they're they're playing him more in the slot and, and he's running slants, he's running wrap routes and digs from the slot. But Kyler would Kyler's getting the ball to Greg Dortch and Kyle's getting the ball to, to Michael Wilson in those instances. I don't think that's wrong from Kyler. Those guys are open. They're good receivers. It's just when they get more of a target, pretty much right now the, the creativity starts and stops at, oh, he's one on one and he's tall and he's long. And so let's put the ball up there for him. I think you know, I, I always hesitate to say that an offensive coordinator should walk in with a plan to feed a guy. I think that sometimes yeah. you see that on offenses, right? Like Malik Neighbors for the Giants, who obviously is a big comparison right now because he's a rookie. And it's like, well, that's the only thing they can do. What else are you going to do on this offense? I understand why Petsing is not forcing the hand on Marv accordingly. With that said, in order to keep the guy like both mentally engaged and also like maybe boost up the confidence a little bit, because I think you're going to start getting better play out of him when he feels like he did in that Rams game, it probably is worth sticking him at, you know off the line in a bunch and running two guys off the line in a little little you know a uh, 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 pick route and create the traffic and then just get Marv the football underneath let him break off a corner on on, on an isolation route they tried that in the red zone he had a safety over him Kyler went the other way it's a touchdown to Dorch I get it but still like I do feel like this might be becoming a situation where you do have to kind of feed him and force feed him a little bit just to make the vibes feel a little bit better. Yeah. The things that I've seen about, or the games that I've watched all 22 of the Cardinals, I always, I walk away feeling like the opponents treat him like he's an A number one receiver, For but sure. the Cardinals For don't. Sure. Yes. That's, which a, that's is, a which is, way of putting it. Yeah. Which is, uh, is a problem, honestly. So if they're going to give him, it's like if you had just any average run in the mill receiver was getting doubled, then of course, you're not going to run anything special for him or force him the ball or try to force him to get open. You're like, oh, cool. You guys, you're going to spend two over here on random Z receiver? Cool. But if you have Justin Jefferson or Jamar Chase, you watch those games or Tyreek Hill, they are doing deep overs across the field to run away from it. They're doing split. They're doing specific things. They're doing screens. They're doing specific things they're because they come into the in game. Motion. No to right. get him releases a lot of motion in the Cardinals offense never with the with the x receiver right a lot with the z a right. lot with the f never with the x that's what you're just leaving marvin siloed out there yeah so that i mean it, it and it seems like they're just like all right cool you guys want to double marvin cool we'll work everything else but i don't know that you can do that now just because they're respecting him that way doesn't mean you should approach the game plan that way yeah. and i think i probably if pet saying you know kool-aid man to this podcast he would say well i like trey mcbride and i like michael wilson and so if i can consistently get those guys targets because marv's got that gravity i feel good about my offense and i think that's 65 percent true like I, I i would understand that reality but i i mcbride and michael wilson is not like you know 
Jalen Waddle or Devontae Smith and right. Dallas Goddard and some of these guys who who get that that value of having a, a wide receiver Higgins, one gravity. Yeah. yeah, like it's their quality, but I don't think they're necessarily at that level in terms of pass catchers. Um, looking forward for the Cardinals. Uh, at Dolphins next week, maybe a good opportunity to get Marv going a little bit, but you do have to worry about Jalen. And then it's versus the Bears and versus the Jets. Uh, I, the, the, it ain't getting easier for wide receivers on the Arizona yeah. Cardinals anytime soon. And so I think we're going to – I mean, it, yeah. the, Jets, the Jets might be mailing it in by now. Who knows what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> one can only hope. Uh, but, yeah, I think that it, it's one of those situations where I feel confident, like film-wise, like Marv can clearly still like run yeah. great routes and he's he's got length, he's got the tools. Like I'm confident that – the the talent is there. What I'm worried about is the connection with him and Kyler, the frustration with with, with his role. And the right, psychology it, the psychology of coaching is something that we don't give much credence to, but like you have to be aware of these things, particularly yeah. with receivers. It's I was like, just I about it. to say, yeah. even if it's not real with anybody else, baby, it's inter- yeah. it's real with the wideouts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so. I mean, even if, even if you don't like it, it's like kind of a, a thing that you have to be aware of is how a player is feeling, especially when he's that talented and that young. So that's on the coaches also. Find a way to get that man the ball. Yeah. Cardinals are three and four. They Every game they play is the weirdest game I've ever seen. They've beaten the Niners. They've lost to the Packers by like 40. Like it's just a very peculiar team uh, with a lot of storylines uh, to watch as we move forward. That is our Monday Night Football uh, doubleheader. Thank you to everybody who didn't hear Mina's voice but stayed on the show. We appreciate it. We promise to never fool you again. It'll be Mina on every show for every second here on out. No? I can't promise that. I can't can't promise that. Hostile takeover incoming. Ben and Dominic (laughs) taking over the show. Everyone have a good week. We will uh, talk to you the next time. We are respectively on our Mina shows.